A reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, and Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favorite woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us and his, as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I really doubt whether the angel Gabriel could have found a more unlikely person to greet anywhere in Israel than Mary. She was young, perhaps 12 or 13 years old, maybe as young as that. In other words, about as the age of my daughter, Catherine. Wow. She was in that awkward stage somewhere between childhood and adulthood. And like so many people in Israel in those days, she was fairly uneducated. She was living in a peasant community. She was living in Nazareth, which was very far from any seat of worldly power. Uh, perhaps you heard the saying that some people had in those days, can anything good come from Nazareth? In fact, I find myself surprised as I hear the reading of God's Word this morning just to hear in verse 26 that the angel Gabriel was sent to the city of Nazareth. I think many people in that culture would have, would have said, really, an angel in Nazareth? Mary was also a female. And do I need to remind you that that was a culture that in so many ways discounted women. And one commentator summarizes the way that people would have looked at things in those days and said that Mary was a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. And yet our beloved older sister in the faith, Mary, was given the greatest honor that any woman has ever been given. She was chosen to be the mother of Jesus, our Lord. And I believe her lowly estate was part of God's purpose. Already right at the beginning of the entrance of the Son of God into the world, you have a sign of His humility that is pointing to His humiliation, showing what He would endure for the salvation of us poor sinners. Martin Luther observed that God might well have gone to Jerusalem and picked out Caiaphas' daughter, fair, rich, clad in gold embroidered raiment, attended by a retinue of maids in waiting. But God preferred a lowly maid from a mean town. This is because God, in His plan of salvation, 
had called Jesus to humble himself and only then to be exalted. This was part of his purpose for rescuing us from our sins and lifting us to glory. Jesus entering into the misery of our lost and fallen condition. And was there a better way to signal this than for him to be born to a woman like Mary from a town like Nazareth? Be encouraged this morning that God's grace is for the lowly and for the humble. The kind of grace that God showed to Mary. This is part of the meaning of the angel's salutation. Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Here is God's benediction pronounced on Mary. God with her to bless her. The word here is the word for favor derived from the Greek word for grace, meaning to be treated with a kind of undeserved kindness. And so even before we had the New Living Translation, we had Martin Luther's paraphrase of Gabriel's greeting, which goes like this, Oh Mary, you are blessed. You have such a gracious God. No woman has ever lived on earth to whom God has shown such grace. And this is the way that Mary helps us, showing us that God can give us the same kind of grace that he gave to her. Not, of course, that we're, we are called to give birth to the Son of God, but here is an example for us that even in what may seem to us at times a small and insignificant place, there may be some here who have even a holy ambition for some wider sphere of ministry. You, you hope to do some great thing for God. And yet here you are in a quiet place of preparation. Even when we feel small and insignificant, perhaps in a place that would be overlooked by the world, God has grace for us. And maybe you need that encouragement this morning that you have a significance in the purpose of God by His grace, that He has a plan and purpose for you in doing the work of His kingdom. Well, Gabriel followed this gracious greeting with an announcement. You'll notice if you have your Bible open in front of you, the announcement is somewhat interrupted by Mary's question in verse 34. But really, the angel is announcing the greatest event in human history to that time, the coming of the Son of God. Gabriel tells Mary not to be afraid, that she has found favor with God, another form of the, ver the wor same word used in verse 28, a, a word for grace. Here is grace upon grace for Mary, that by the favor of God she would give birth to a son. And Gabriel then proceeded in clear, simple, and yet profound words to explain the significance of this child. His name would be Jesus. God saves the Lord is salvation. Even from this birth announcement, his name would testify to his saving work, that Jesus of Nazareth is the salvation of God. The angel says that Jesus would be great. Now, this is the uh, kind of thing I always hesitate to say in grad school chapel because I know there are a few Bible scholars hiding uh, behind the students somewhere at the back of the room. But I think you will find that in the Old Testament, when the word great is used without any kind of uh, qualification or specification, it refers in some way to God himself, to his divine majesty. His wisdom is great. His works are great. His power, his mercy, all of these things are said in Scripture to be great. He is the only one who deserves to be called great in this sense. And that is the sense that... The angel Gabriel gives to this child of the Virgin Mary. He would be great. It's a testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. No one greater than he is. No one greater in wisdom or power or love or in the majesty of his divine being. His greatness is the very greatness of God. And so here you see, even in these few words, an amazing, mysterious juxtaposition of meekness and of majesty, of lowliness and of exaltation. And we will see this run all the way through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, born in the humblest circumstances, suffering loneliness, homelessness, rejection, persecution, torture, the very worst things that any human being can experience in the world, things which some of us here in this community in one way or another have experienced. And then Jesus humbled himself all the way to the death. And yet all the while, he is still the divine Son of God. 
And at the end of his earthly sufferings, God exalts him back to this greatness by raising him from the dead. Usually we get this exactly backwards. We exalt ourselves, trying to make ourselves seem a little bit greater than we are, O oh, vain ambition. And then God has to humble us because we have tried to exalt ourselves. But we see the opposite pattern in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, which is set forward as the pattern for us, humbling himself and letting God take care of any exalting that he chooses to give. This is the pattern of the ministry and life of Jesus Christ. And so the angel testifies here to his greatness, even in his lowly estate. The angel says further that he will be called the Son of the Most High, a favorite expression of King David, who often used this, this vocabulary, the Most High, to praise the Lord. And here Gabriel identifies Jesus as the Son of the Most High. It's really a phrase that could be used for any child of God. We've been reminded from our reading in Galatians of our high and lofty condition, that we are the children of God, and because we are children, then we are heirs of God. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High. But this title belongs to Jesus in a unique way, because His divine sonship is His eternal identity, the second person of the Trinity, God, the eternal Son. And It seems right, therefore, that the angel would say further that Jesus will rule in majesty, that he will sit on the ancient throne of David, David who loved to call God the Most High. Jesus is the son of this David. And so here is the birth announcement, a birth announcement unlike any other ever given, that Mary would have a son named Jesus, who would be the great Savior and Son of God, the most powerful ruler in the history of the world. And Mary believed all of that. But this was her question. How will this be since I am still a virgin? She obviously understood the angel to be saying that her child would be conceived before her coming marriage to Joseph. Everyone knows that they were engaged. And you may know that in those days, a betrothal was formalized in a public ceremony. There may be some people here this morning from cultures in which something like this custom persists to this day. The formal betrothal generally lasted as long as a year, and during that year, the bride was even sometimes referred to as the man's wife, but the couple did not live together. They certainly did not have sexual relations. In those days, an engagement was regarded as a definite promise of future marital fidelity any violation was regarded as adultery. And as a godly woman, Mary was preserving her purity. Her sexual uh, identity before God was a prize, something that she was preserving for the gift of marriage and ultimately offering as a gift to her Lord. And that raised an obvious question. How could she conceive and bear a son if she had never, you know, been with a man in that way. That was the question that she had for Gabriel. She knew enough about the reproductive process to know that this was impossible. How can this be? And I think it's a question not asked in unbelief. I think she believes that the angel's promise will come true. She just is curious about the ways of God. How will these things happen? And is there anything that she needs to do? It was a good, honest question. And Gabriel gave her the answer. And not only the answer, but in his grace, in the grace of God, gave a sign to confirm the promise. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. What a great answer that is to so many questions. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And then the angel's sign, your relative in her old age, Elizabeth, has also conceived... This is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Nothing will be impossible with God. I love the way Luke writes his gospel. Here, as a good historian, he gives us the plain facts. I was interested to read the uh, review that our own Daniel Trier gave of a recent book by Andrew Lincoln on the virgin birth. And Lincoln is a skeptic about many things in the gospels, and he calls Luke's affirmation of the virgin birth, a minority report. 
I don't think it's a minority report. I think it's the gospel truth. And like a good physician, Luke puts these facts into their medical context. He mentions here that Elizabeth was getting close to the end of her second trimester. It's the kind of little detail that Luke often gives us. This story of Jesus and the manner of his birth is not some bizarre myth. It's factual history. And the fact is that this is one of the most stupendous miracles that God has ever performed, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And yet we find Mary here asking the same question I think many people still ask today. How can this be? How could a woman become pregnant without having sexual relations? I think the angel Gabriel treats this as a simple matter if you believe in the power of God. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's the miracle of the virgin birth that believers in Christ have confessed from the very earliest days of the church, which we have confessed this morning in multiple languages. What's the phrase for born of the Virgin Mary? I didn't have time to write it down. Bakira Maria, that's the Virgin, uh, that's the Virgin Mary. And what is um, born of the Virgin Mary? That's, there's a verb there, Anna, Anna, like he said. <laughs> born of the Virgin Mary. We, uh, we say it as well in the Nicene Creed, that God the Son was incarnated by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. This is the faith that we confess. And so Mary's pregnancy, this is the way that one commentator describes it, is an act of divine grace explicable not in terms of human insemination, but only in terms of the creative power of the Holy Spirit. I think the word that Gabriel uses here is significant. He talks about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. It's language that echoes the Old Testament and reminds us that the Holy Spirit has been actively involved in everything that the Trinity has ever done. The Spirit was present at creation, overshadowing or hovering over the waters. The Spirit was there at the Exodus, overshadowing the tabernacle with a visible manifestation of the glory of God. The Spirit would overshadow Jesus, anointing Him for His earthly ministry. And you go through the significant things that Jesus did in offering obedience to the Father, in resisting temptation, in offering His life as an atonement, in being raised from the grave. And you see the witness and involvement of the Holy Spirit in everything that that Jesus did and was able to do. And the Spirit now overshadowing the church. It's in His power that we serve Christ today. But no work of the Spirit is more miraculous than what he did in Mary's womb, enabling a virgin to give birth to the Son of God. Here is one of the essential facts and amazing ministry uh, mysteries of Christian faith. According to Luke, Mary had a child before she had intercourse. Do you believe this or not? I think if we say that Jesus was not born of a virgin, then either we believe that Mary was sexually immoral or that Luke was a writer of fiction or some other thing that would be contrary to the plain teaching of Scripture. And even worse, ultimately, I believe we would be denying the deity of Jesus Christ. In some mysterious way, His conception by the Holy Spirit makes Him the Holy Son of God. Gabriel is drawing some of these connections for us. It's, therefore, the child will be called holy. It's, it's His unique identity is caught up in this overshadowing work of the Holy Spirit. Of course, Jesus had to be born of a woman to be a man. But if He had been merely the physical offspring of Joseph... He would have been nothing more than a man. No, his virgin birth, his divine conception by the Spirit, these things were necessary for his incarnation and necessary in a mysterious way for that um, incarnate connection between humanity and deity. One person, two natures, divine and human, conceived by a unique creative act of the Holy Spirit. Our fallen humanity could not produce out of its own resources a Savior. No, divine initiative, divine intervention was needed. And so God sent Jesus into the world as the perfect Son of God. And in case you had any trouble believing this, God gave Mary a sign, proving his sovereignty over the womb. It's, it's a lesser sign, but it's, a, it's an important sign. It's lesser because Elizabeth was not the virgin mother of John, 
but it is a sign of God's power over the womb. And on the basis of this sign, the angel says to Mary at the end, nothing will be impossible with God. If he can bring a child out of a barren womb, if he can do that, then his spirit is well able to make a virgin conceive and bear a son. And take another step of logic. If God can perform this miracle, then his grace is sufficient for any challenge or difficulty in the daily life of ordinary believers in Christ. You see, this affirmation in verse 38 Rather, in verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. That's not simply a kind of conclusion to the story of the virgin birth and its announcement. It's actually a a verse to live by throughout the whole Christian life. Nothing is impossible with God. If you believe in the God of the virgin birth, nothing is impossible in your experience, nothing that is in keeping with the purposes of God for your life. Maybe you've been burdened by some great sin. A sin that at some level you've confessed and yet you still hold on to some of the feelings of the guilt of that sin. Maybe you're struggling with a sin that you can't seem to, uh, seem to overcome. You try and you try again and yet you fail. Maybe the thing that seems impossible for you is some family situation and maybe it's even one where you've tried to help with some of your counseling skills maybe or biblical insight and it really hasn't made a difference at all, and you realize this problem is far beyond what any mere human being could resolve. Maybe it seems impossible for some of your physical and financial needs to be met. Uh, Maybe there's a kind of shadow over your academic experience because you have a, a concern about how you'll be able to continue in your studies or how God will provide. Maybe your what seems impossible to you is actually realizing some of the dreams that you have for your studies and for your future ministry. Or maybe it's some suffering in your life that God has not yet been pleased to remove. Or maybe the impossible thing is somebody you love and you just really, it's really hard to imagine how they would ever come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's, it's just, you can't even imagine how it would happen almost. The Bible says nothing is impossible with God. Here is the God of the virgin birth. There's no sin he cannot forgive, no relationship he could not reconcile, no problem that he could not resolve, no need he can't meet, no ministry he can't bless, no grief that he cannot comfort, no life he is unable to reclaim, no sinner he cannot save. I love the way that Martin Luther talked about the virgin birth and its implications for our experience. He was explaining how how Christianity is different from all other religions and how this is signified in the virgin birth. He said, Christianity doesn't begin at the top the way other religions do. It begins at the bottom. And so when you're concerned to think and act about your salvation, put away speculations about majesty and works and philosophy. Run to the manger and the mother's womb. Embrace this infant and virgin's child in your arms and look at him. Look at him born, being nursed, growing up, going about in human society, teaching, dying, rising again, ascending above the heavens, having authority over all things. Look at these things and you will shake off all terrors as the sun dispels the clouds. This is the grace that God has for us in the power of the virgin birth. He is the God who makes all things possible. Do you believe this? Mary believed it. And so her encounter with the angel ends with a great confession of her faith. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The scripture says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mary had that assurance. Here was something hoped for, something she hadn't seen yet, and yet she had a conviction about it. She didn't raise any objections. She didn't hold out for an easier calling. She didn't ask God for a lot more explanation. I mean, there are lots of other questions that Mary could have asked of Gabriel in this encounter. She could have asked God to explain, well, if I say yes to that, then what will happen? All she needed to know was what God wanted her to do. And she trusted him with all of the rest of the details. She trusted God even when it seemed impossible. And in that trust, offered herself as God's servant. What 
Uh, great honor was hers. I'll say it again. The greatest honor any woman has ever been given. I suppose the greatest honor any believer has ever been given. To this day, Mary is blessed as the mother of Jesus. Indeed, if we have our theology straight, she is the mother of God in that sense. But understand that her great service also led to great suffering. She gave up almost everything she knew and loved. In that moment, she had to be willing to give up Joseph. Nothing was said about him in this promise. The man she was engaged to marry. I mean, how could she expect him still to consent to their marriage if he discovered that she were pregnant with a child that was not his own? She had to be willing to give up her reputation. I mean, it wouldn't hard to be hard to think of all the things that people would say in a town like Nazareth. There were other trials as well, the physical pains of pregnancy and childbirth, and then all the hardships Mary could not possibly have predicted, the journey to Bethlehem, the exile in Egypt, the hatred of Herod, and then everything she endured when Jesus became a man and fulfilled his ministry, and at the very end of all that, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his bloody burial, Mary was there as a witness to all of that. This is what it meant for her to submit her will to God's will. For her life. This is what it meant for Mary to say, I surrender all. It was a lifetime of suffering for the glory of God. How was she able to do it? How was she able to offer such costly service? She did it by faith in the God of the virgin birth and what ultimately became her faith in his son. I think we could really say that Mary was the first Christian. A Christian is simply a person who believes in Jesus and says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be to me according to your word. For us, that means trusting God for our relationships, romantic and otherwise, not making them go the way we want them to go, but letting God lead and fulfill his purpose. It means trusting God in our daily studies with all of their burdens leaving to him whatever success we may achieve or fail to achieve. It means trusting God for ministry, being content with whatever blessing he brings or chooses not to bring as long as we're faithful. That's, that's our calling. It means trusting God with our families, asking him to carry our burden for the people we love. It means trusting him for any burden or difficulty or challenge in life. Are you willing to trust God and serve God in this way? If you are, then the thing to do is simply say what Mary said. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be to be according to your word. And you will find the truth of what the scripture says in your life. Nothing's impossible with God. Our Father, we give you praise for this great promise. For the example of our sister Mary for the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we offer to you in these moments the things that seem impossible to us, and we offer them to you and ask that in your time and in your way, we would see your grace in each of these areas of life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.